Thank you for joining us for Behind Our Science, episode 16, where we talk about mentoring and science sustainability. We're excited to provide advice and insight on these two tremendously important topics that researchers face at every level today. First up, we meet and discuss mentoring with Dr. Adam Grace from Emory University, who shared with us his mentoring practices and his tips on creating a holistic lab culture management style. We also hear from our co-host, me, on my recent attendance to the Arachda 2023 Scientific Teaching Conference and finish our episode with an interview with Polycarbon co-founder Noah Piles, who takes his desire for a more sustainable planet outside of his own lab into yours. Up next is our interview with Dr. Adam Grace. Enjoy. Thank, Thank you, you for listening in. We are with Adam Grace, Assistant Professor in the Division of Digestive Diseases in the Department of Medicine at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. Dr. Grace received his PhD and his Master's of Science from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and his lab studies chromatin regulatory mechanisms that establish and maintain cellular identity both in the intestine and interhepatic bile ducts, which is right up my alley because I love the gut liver axis. Thank you for being with us today, Adam. Yeah, thank you for having me. So, Adam, we're going to start off with um, a question that we came across um, on your website. Uh, and what was really awesome about your website is you have a mentorship philosophy. Uh, could you tell us a bit about how you designed this philosophy and how you implement it? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I um, <laughs> it's been a while since I thought about that. You know, you mentioned I trained at UNC postdoc there. I also had a, a short um, period where I was a, a non-tenure track faculty at UNC, and that's where I you know, thought about um, what my lab is going to look like, you know, how am I going to project my independent group? And around the same time, I was putting together, you know, faculty applications, thinking about what like my mentoring and teaching statement was going to be. And that's where I started like formalizing, you know, what the mentoring statement is. And as I was, uh, was doing that and putting together the website, I was like, hey, I just want to put this out there because I was thinking kind of about all of the positive and negative and intermediate things I had experienced as a mentee in science and thinking about how I could be, um, I don't know, I think thoughtful about that going forward and establishing my own group and projecting out there what's important to me as a, as a mentor and how to, um, you know, start that conversation with prospective mentees in the lab. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. And it's nice that you were able to sort of establish that early on. You mentioned being a postdoc and then also being a non-tenure track faculty. And I know that that tends to be a um, sort of career trajectory that a lot of faculty are facing. How did you know you were ready to establish your lab? That's a great question. And uh, I don't know that I have a really satisfying answer. I think I, you know, I wrote a couple of career development awards and ended up getting concurrently funded by a research scholar award from the American Gastroenterological Association. And then very shortly thereafter by a, a KO1 from NIDDK. And those actually funded the, the liver and the intestine part of my research program, respectively. And so I guess I was ready because I had the funding to be faculty and to have, you know, a small little research group. So for four years, I had what I like to call an army of undergrads and, you know, one research technician at a time because those awards aren't enough to support, you know, a full group with you know, advanced trainees, grad students and postdocs. And so I, I'd like to think of it more kind of like a super postdoc position. But at the time, I think, you know, I, I had a lot of ideas that I was excited about that I wanted to work on independently. Uh, it just felt like the right time to start writing the grants and putting those ideas out there. And I was lucky enough to get funded. Um, so I guess it's, you know, having the ideas and then being able to go after the funding. Nice. Thanks, Adam. So let me follow up on the last, one of the last things you, you mentioned. Uh, you sort of said that you transitioned from a sort of like a faculty position early on, and then you transitioned to your current position. Um, so what changed? Was there something that changed from your original position um, to now the one that you're at? Because I'm like, for example, I was a research assistant professor. And now that I have my own lab, it's very different. So is there something that changed for you and your philosophy and the things that you shared with us? 
Yeah, you know, I, I actually just had a, um, I did a Zoom with a, a friend of mine's PhD student who was, uh, had similar questions about moving forward. You know, they had their own ideas, which path should they go? And I think there are a lot of pros and cons, and maybe you experienced this as well. I, I feel like, you know, the time I had as non-tenure track faculty is almost like a super postdoc, right? Like I still spent a lot of time at the bench. I didn't have administrative duties. I taught, you know, on a very limited basis, excuse me, just to get experience doing that and some exposure to the grad students. But really, like it was me and the undergrads, like plugging away at the science. And, you know, I had to submit my IACUC protocols. I had to do all the regulatory stuff. And I thought I had a pretty good grasp on like the day to day. And now three years into the tenure track position, it is, I'm sure you know, very, very different. And so I think, you know, trying to stay with the theme of mentorship, one of the things that's kind of changed for me a lot and keeps evolving as my lab grows is how I'm able to interact with my mentees. And, you know, I'm, I'm very, and you may have seen this in the mentoring statement, I feel like I'm a very um, bench-driven scientist. Like, I like doing experiments. I try to reserve some time to be at the bench pipetting, like, even if it's something like, I'm a pouring bacterial place when I have a couple minutes at the end of like a long day of office work that makes me happy. And so I think I've had to change my mentorship style a little bit um, because I just don't have the time anymore to be, you know, at the bench next to the student walking them through a protocol. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, it is quite a difference in when you transition into the kind of a more senior roles. Um, one thing that um, was really interesting in your uh, mentoring philosophy that I noted was um, you stated where each lab member from undergrad to postdoc feels that they have an equal opportunity shareholder in the success of the lab. And I, I really like that um, kind of analogy of seeing a lab as somewhat of a business um, or kind of mirroring that kind of language and I'm wondering like uh, how you came, came about kind of um, having that lab management style and what inspired that kind of that language and whether you do see your kind of running a lab as somewhat of a small business. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I th you know, if anyone's on social media, I think we all know there's this debate, is the lab a business? Is it a family? Is it like a corporation? Is it a mom and pop, right? And, and how do we approach this? You know, I think in, in terms of what inspired this idea of wanting everybody to feel invested is, you know, goes back to my training. So, you know, I, I was like a lot of people on the pre-med path, and then I, I eventually saw the light and then decided to do a PhD. And, you know, my mentor, Scott Magnus at UNC, played a, a major role in that. And I actually started in Scott's lab when he was on his KO1 and he was doing the same thing. Like he had a bunch of undergrads, right? He didn't have hard money from the institution, but he was getting the program up and rolling. And he was very engaged, engaged at the bench. You know, he was teaching me every day and it was really empowering for me. And I could see how the data I was generating was important, right? Like this was stuff he was taking and putting out in the field. And that was um, a really, really positive experience for me. And that's something that I, I wanted to maintain, you know, as I knew I was going to be getting postdocs in and grad students. And now these are the people who are mentoring undergrads or more junior graduate students who are coming in. I wanted to make sure that we didn't establish like a hierarchy, right? Where it's all about the postdocs idea and, you know, the undergrads just counting some cells for them right like everyone needs to have their own project everyone needs to feel like they're contributing and like their ideas are being heard and i feel like it's it's actually you know the more the lab grows the more work it is i think to encourage people to speak up and to and to feel like self-actualized um, i feel like that's something i try to be intentional about um, and make sure that people understand, you know, even if you're starting out, even if you have a small piece of a project, you know, you're cloning for the first time, like this matters to us, like you're having an impact and what you're learning and what you're sharing with us is also important. Yeah, I really like that. Um, everyone contributing and having an impact on the project overall. Yeah. And, you know, I think the other side of that too is, you know, I, I've always had a lot of ideas. There's a lot of things I want to chase. Um, and so I think I'm, I'm, the further I go, the more happy I am with 
the direction of the science, even if it's not exactly where I thought we were going to go. And I know that for the long-term success of the lab, we're going to do better if some of the ideas are being driven by the trainees, right? And people are going to feel more invested if they're kind of taking the general direction of the lab and then maybe steering it um, where they're interested in going. Um, and that keeps it exciting for me as well. Yeah, that's that's really nice. And it's also important, like I I have this big grandiose idea that I'm gonna be setting the gut liver axis, but really like you have to follow the data. The data is gonna tell you where your project is gonna go or where your research program is gonna go. So it's nice that you're able to like sort of recognize that you had an idea and that's not where it's going, but it's still exciting. So it's very enlightening. Um, but to sort of switch it up, to have a little bit of a fun question, what is your favorite organ since you studied both the intestine and the liver? Oh man, that is a tough one. Uh, I go back and forth. Uh, and I think that's why I study both, you know, I, I think it, it depends where the data is coming in that day or that week when I'm most excited about. Um, very different. The liver, uh, it's new for me. I'm a baby in the liver field. Uh, so I think there's a lot of excitement and I feel like there's a lot of things I don't know, which, which, you know, spurs my curiosity. Um, but the intestine is, you know, my first love. So I don't know. I don't think I could pick favorites. Wow. Okay. I like that. You're like the intestine is my first love. That's very cute. <laughs> um, and I'm going to have a sort of like a, an important question that we try to engage people because we we have undergraduates and people that we want to target sort of like listen and so i mean with with you mentioned a little bit about having people being involved in the science right meaning like the part of the project and and their their inclusion and the, that it matters not establishing hierarchy and uh making sure that people know that they're, they're what they're doing is important and it's it's not just being here just just check a box right and so with that in mind how do you think we can best encourage like new, new generations, people that are either just starting in the field or getting into STEM to stay in research or actually do a PhD when other careers appear to be more appealing or better um, or more more sustainable or more profitable, maybe not sustainable, profitable um, than getting into research or academic research. What, what would you think it's better or what would you be, what would you say in your, in your words would be a good way to encourage new generations? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question, uh, and that's I'll have to think. Up, just mean like a little, if you yeah. Have. No, it, it's something I've thought about a lot, and you know, I think um, I think where we are, you know, after COVID, being in this post-pandemic long stage, like so many things have changed, and you know, I think that there is a lot of understandable anxiety with students, with postdocs, with trainees about long-term prospects, about, you know, what's my financial outlook? Uh, you know, what do I do in my career? And I've, um, you know, at this point, I guess I, I have some mentorship experience with, like I said, a lot of undergrads who are trying to make that decision between med school, grad school, go get a normal job, right? Uh, and with junior grad students, you know, I, I, I've talked to a lot of junior grad students in this position who are already having a lot of anxiety over, you know, do I go to industry or do I go to academia? And I'm like, whoa, you've got like five years before you really have to make that decision. So I, I, I think there's a lot of anxiety. Maybe I'll sound like an old man, but I think a lot of it's driven by all this exposure on social media, right? Like I think that you open Twitter and you see this conversation about career prospects and you're thinking, you know, six years further ahead than you need to. And that can drive a lot of anxiety. So maybe the first thing I can say actionably is, is encouraging people to focus on where they are now. That doesn't mean you don't have a long-term plan and you don't have a long-term goal, but understanding that like the goal you have at the beginning of grad school doesn't have to be, you're not committing to that. Right. Like I know plenty of people and I'm sure you guys do, too, who have labs who will tell you, you know, labs at a major R1 institution. Like I decided to really do this during my postdoc. Um, so every path is different. Um, nothing is ever, a, you know, commitment for the rest of your life. And I think finding a way to focus and, you know, find enjoyment in the moment. Um, 
And then balancing that with career planning, with checking in, you know, I, I meet weekly for an hour with everybody in my group. Uh, and, you know, if we have time at the end of the science, I always try to make an effort, even if it's a couple of minutes to say, what about the career stuff? What are you thinking about? Uh, who do you want to be when you grow up? Uh, are there things we can do? Are there workshops you can go to to explore options? You know, so you always kind of have this in the back of your mind, but it's not crushing you with anxiety. Um, I think another side of that, and I, I think something that's a, a more of an institutional level answer is, you know, especially trying to attract people from diverse backgrounds, um, people who are first generation college students. I've had been fortunate enough to mentor a lot of people who are classified um, in those situations. And, you know, I think that, uh, you know, being able to say, you know, go to grad school for five years, you know, don't have a, you know, great income from that, live on a stipend. That's a privileged statement, right? I mean, that's something that's extraordinarily difficult for a lot of the same people that we're trying to attract and encourage and, and retain. Uh, and I think that, you know, this is the kind of thing where at our level, we're all at this like early career transition stage. We get to be a part of the voices in the room who are advocating for more support for trainees and, and trying to address some of these larger systemic problems. But, you know, it's one mentor in one lab. It's it's there's only so many of those things that you have the power um, to address in the moment. Thank you. Yeah, you touched on some really important points there. Um, and I do think that a lot of headway has been made um, to support um, a more diverse uh, lab environment. Um, so yeah, we just, yeah, you're right about just like one lab can't do it all uh, and it has to be a team effort. And hopefully um, our audience from behind our science uh, will get on board as well. And, and they, a lot of them have already gotten on board. Um, but it's it's great to to keep um, amplifying that message. One um, on a more like uh, technical note, <laughs> um, switching gears a little bit. Um, one thing I like we are very curious about is kind of I like I like to hear that kind of the the scheduling um, the one hour sessions with your students. Um, one other thing that um, comes to mind is how you organize all the lab goals and tasks. Uh, what sort of system do you have in place for that? Uh, do you use any websites like Trello or Todoist or, um, and, and how do you kind of gather all that data from all uh, the members of the lab um, in something that works uh, for the, the greater purpose of the lab? I don't have a good answer for that. I, uh, uh, I, I played around with some um, like kind of management software we do we've done all of our um, lab notebooks in evernote for a long time and um but we don't use it for communication uh you know my lab when i got here i actually i moved um august 2020 so pre-vaccine peak covid in the atlanta area so you know it's kind of been slow growth getting people in and getting rolling uh, but very recently we hired a, a really wonderful new graduate student and new postdoctoral fellow so suddenly you know i woke up one day and there were 11 people in the group um so things have kind of changed very very recently even in the last week i have been um encouraged by the lab which i love you know they have to drive these decisions um to take up slack uh, I've been very slack of adverse for a very long time, um, but I feel I'm, I'm optimistic about that working well for us to communicate. The other nice thing is because, you know, we have two major areas of focus, intestine and bile duct. There are obviously multiple projects with everybody in those two little subgroups, but it kind of makes it easier to have the lab kind of broken into almost smaller labs and then people interacting and sharing the same ideas within that group. So. You know, I guess bringing it back to organization, the way that works best for me is I tell everybody in the lab to treat me like a reagent, right? Uh, I'm a PI, I have the memory of a goldfish. As soon as you leave this room from that one hour meeting, my mind has gone blank. I forgot everything you said, but come in, you know, brief me, get me up to date. And that's your time with me. You know, if you want to talk to me for an hour about career development stuff, you know, prep me, set up the question, run it by me. If it's data, you know, <laughs> blind me to the data, try to trick me, show me the data, make me make the conclusion before you tell me which group is which. Use me like a reagent, basically, uh, is what I tell people a lot. So yeah, I guess it, it's not very organized. It's maybe not the 
most clear cut answer, but maybe organized chaos is how I do it. Yeah, that seems to be academia overall is organized chaos. <laughs> Um, I, I mean, I, so I, one of the things that I thought was astonishing is that not only do you have like a mentoring philosophy on your website, you also have your lab protocols on your website for, I'm assuming your lab members to be able to have a centralized location. And that's something that's really important to me as a postdoc where I'm trying to maybe start a new experiment I've never done, or maybe I'm trying to troubleshoot to make it work consistently in a lab, like what propelled you to put your lab protocols in like one online resource? Yeah, so we um, we actually manage most of those on like a big Google Drive. We have protocols, databases, things of that nature. Um, we have a lab handbook on the um, website, which is, you know, password protected, but nothing really mystical or private behind there. It's, you know, policy, training, getting onboarded. It's really, it was like a time management strategy for me um, because, you know, it, eventually you get all these other duties once you're on the tenure track, teaching, service, administrative stuff, writing grants, reviewing things that I kind of wanted to streamline the process. So, you know, I, I still want people the first time they do a protocol, you know, especially if it's somebody more junior, certainly undergrads or junior grad students, I'm like, you know, I want to go through the protocol with you. I want to go to the bench and show you the, you know, everyone's got the little magic tricks that you can't really put in the protocol. It's like, you know, the way you touch the cryostat or, you know, the way you pipette the supernatant off this invisible pellet. Um, so I'll show them those things. But this way, there's a starting point where I can say, hey, go check out the protocol database. Um, you know, and, and take a look, read through it, assemble the reagent, and then make a list of everything that you need to ask me or somebody more senior in the lab. So it's just about streamlining. And it also makes people, you know, um, empowers other people in the lab to modify the protocol and, you know, replace mine. Like, like everyone, you know, is, is, is starting to surpass me in technical bench ability because uh, they're out there doing the work every day. And um, it's cool that the lab and the protocols are evolving in that way. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Adam. So, um, for for the questions that I had, and I'm gonna end it on like a high note and something easy. Um, if you had to choose, or maybe you have one, um, do you have like a walk up song? Let's say for as a wrestler or a boxer, if you're coming in, like if you're doing like I have the tiger or something like that, what what is your walk up song? My walk up song. That's a really good question. Uh, I feel like it changes all the time. I should have prepared an answer for that one. Maybe a couple. Let's say a bad day. You're having a bad day in the lab. You're probably not in the best of moods or you just focus on one. What will be that? And like, yeah, like, for example, like I do, like when we have like ample like experiments, I don't do any music. I don't do anything. If I'm walking into the lab and people see me like with food, I mean, I'm mostly like like having like some hip hop, something in my background, right? Like um, that's what I'm thinking about. Um, so it changes. So if you have any, I mean, any like, or, or... Uh, Oh, um, probably the song that I'm bumping going into the garage every morning is Cuff It by Beyonce. Um, but yeah, uh, that might be my current walk up song. Love Beyonce. Um... Uh, I also have another uh, fun question, and uh, it is, what is your next vacation? That's a great question. I've actually, uh, so I just, uh, my boyfriend and I were in Italy for two weeks, uh, so I'm still kind of readjusting from that. Uh, but we already st started planning next year uh, in Japan. Uh, so hopefully that's going to happen. Started doing some research and looking at airline tickets and excited for it that's really cool yeah wow like a internationalist too over here so okay you love to travel but if you were not in stem what would your career be that's a really good question i don't even know i i guess you know i was on that pre-med track but i don't know that you know clinical lifestyle is for me i actually when i was in high school i had a um a band uh, and we actually considered taking the a gap year between high school and college and buying a van to go tour. So in some parallel universe alternate timeline, uh, maybe I'm in a rock band. All right. Yeah. No. Grace and the Kicks or something like. <laughs> 
Oh, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much for, you know, being a part of this podcast. It's, I mean, we've obviously recorded the video, but it's also available in audio only. Um, and yeah, I, this was really nice. I, I do have one more question, if that's okay with y'all, that I would like to ask. So, um, it, what advice do you have? Because we're hoping to release this sort of at the beginning of, of the academic year. What advice do you have for students or postdocs that are sort of interviewing PIs or trying to find what lab is the right fit? Sure, that's a great great question. I mean, that's the most important thing about um, grad school and, and postdocing, right? Is having that fit in that relationship. What I encourage people to do before you go into that conversation is think about what you need as a mentee, right? Like we all have different needs, we have different goals, and sometimes we don't really take the time or the space to think about and define those things. So if you can do that, and you can say, "Here's my working style. Here's what's important to me," like here is my communication style and here are my goals, and then I think it helps you frame that conversation and give a prospective mentor something tangible to respond to, right? And that way, you know, you know yourself and you're bringing that into the interaction. Yeah, that is amazing advice. Thank you. I'm glad I asked. <laughs> we hope that you've enjoyed our interview with Dr. Grace from Emory University. Be sure to check out his website and follow him on Twitter if you're interested in learning more about his approach to mentorship and lab management. And now I'm excited to talk about my experience at the ERACTA 2023 conference in San Antonio, Texas, home of the Alamo. This year's conference was planned out and hosted by the San Antonio ERACTA group at UT Health San Antonio. They executed an informative and beautifully organized conference that celebrated scientific teaching and the culturally rich city they work in. If you're interested in IRACTA programs in Texas, please check out their Twitter at SA underscore IRACDA for details. This year, a few of the Rutgers IRACTA fellows made their way to my home state of Texas. My friend Melanie and I were excited to find Rutgers well represented at the Newark airport once we arrived, we had to check out the San Antonio barbecue scene at Pinkerton's. Y'all, it was amazing. The, bricket, the brisket <laughs> melted in your mouth and the potato salad left you wanting more. Next, we checked out the Riverwalk, which is a great tourist spot with many restaurants, bars, and shops that give you a little glimpse of the history and community within San Antonio. I also got to sneak away and visit a beautiful live oak that covered the courtyard outside the Alamo. I'll always remember the Alamo thanks to this gorgeous tree. The conference provided amazing keynote and plenary talks ranging from diversifying biomedical research, how to achieve well-being in STEM, how to implement and learn from AI in the classroom, and how to be a good mentor in this post-COVID world. These talks by Dr. Allison Gamey, Dr. Sharon Milgram, Dr. Derek Bruff, and Dr. M Beth Myrand, respectively, touched on important topics to Iraq the fellows and directors. We learned that as a community, we can approach science education with mentorship, empathy, and equity in mind without losing the importance of the content we teach. We also got to attend various breakout sessions that covered a wide range of topics, including important funding mechanisms for postdoctoral fellows through the NIH, NIGMS, and BWF, or Burroughs Welcome Fund, how to avoid burnout as a mentor, how to utilize inclusive pedagogy in the classroom, and tips and tricks for effective data management in and out of the classroom. We also learned strategies for implementing active learning techniques when designing a course, which is really important when we want to make sure that our content goes through to our students. We got some amazing photos with fun Iracta backdrops and fun swag that included a taco stress ball that I'll be sure to use for years to come. We enjoyed great food and a banquet to network and meet with other Iracta fellows from across the U.S. We also enjoyed local entertainment, including cultural dancing from Grupo Folclorico de Bendiciones, which performed amazing dance styles in traditional dresses at the conference hall, and an all-woman mariachi that even performed my favorite song, El Rey by Vicente Fernandez, at the Macne Art Museum. It was an amazing experience for me as a first-year Aracta fellow to meet and learn about other fellows' research and teaching styles. If you're interested in learning more about ERACTA programs, scan our QR code or visit the ERACTA NIH website to find an ERACTA institution near you. If you have any questions or want to ask about my experience, feel free to reach out to us on social media. 
Up next is our interview with Noah Piles, co-founder of Polycarbon. So thank you everyone for joining us for this next section. Uh, this uh, is an important subject that we're trying to um, take back into the lab and it comes from policy, from science, uh, research and every aspect of our lives. So this segment is very important and we're trying to highlight it as much as we can. This month has awareness about sustainability and as such, we are talking today about the importance of sustainability in the research lab and how much it translates into our daily lives. Thanks, Roberto. Uh, science sustainability is such a huge issue that we have to consider um, as we move into the future for sustainability for our research, especially with all the consumables that we use every day. Um, and this is a topic that I don't think is discussed enough. Um, and here today, we have a very special guest on our podcast. Uh, we have the co-founder of Polycarbon, uh, Noah Piles. So uh, prior to co-founding Polycarbon, Noah was actually a physician scientist in training at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. And prior to enrolling in medical school, Noah spent some time as a research technician at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, where he studied antisense oligonucleotide therapeutics for numerous rare neurological conditions. He's an avid fly fisherman, aspiring conservationist, and uh, polycarbon has given him that opportunity to treat uh, the emperor of all maladies, climate change. So I'm delighted to welcome Noah here today. Um, we have a couple of questions uh, about how we can make uh, science more sustainable. So welcome to the show, Noah. Thank you so much. I really appreciate being here. And that was quite an introduction. Thanks. Um, so first off, what does science sustainability mean to you? Uh, it's a really good question. Uh, it's about recognizing that you're part of a bigger ecosystem, something I failed to do when I was uh, entrenched in it. Uh, it also means reevaluating the basic assumptions you have and why you do what you do. And when it comes to the single use economy that the life science industry is remarkably dependent upon, it's about questioning what what is something made of and how is it managed after you're done with it. And those two questions basically led to me founding the company. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's definitely a great way of seeing it. Um, what is Polycarbon all about? And uh, tell us about how uh, you got inspired to start Polycarbon. Yeah, so I was doing, I was in my research year at Pitt and I was in an ALS lab and we were doing optogenetics there, really cool therapies um, where we were trying to basically induce aggregations of proteins using light. And I did about 16 months of research and I can honestly say that I don't know that I materially contributed to treating ALS. I don't know if that's my legacy, but I did realize there was a legacy of my work, which was just thousands and thousands of pounds of single use plastic. In fact, like the day that I realized I wanted to start looking into this issue, I was cleaning out an incubator with a bunch of expired plates. And I had just opened up a 45 gallon biohazard box that morning and I filled the whole thing by myself with all this plastic where I didn't even get to experiment on the plates. And it made me realize like, man, I've done this a lot. <laughs> and maybe I'm a terrible scientist, but maybe there's other people out there like me that are seeing this issue where we just have all, my, all this waste. And the perception that we have is that this plastic is cheap. That's why we do this. It's really cost effective to use this material. But like, is that really the case? Is there another cost to this? And so but when I started to look into it, like there was actually something pretty staggering that I realized and pretty troubling that I realized. And it was that the plastics that I was throwing away, all these like failed and stubbornly unrejected null hypotheses of the work I was doing, they were all being buried in a community where I was actually volunteering and like doing work. And so um, I like to tell folks when I talk about the founding of the story that it was actually in East McKeesport, Allegheny, where I was doing rotations. That's where 10 million pounds of single use plastics were being buried every single year coming from the UPMC school system, from the Allegheny healthcare system. And it was shocking. And I was thinking like, man, like not only does the scientific community deserve a better way to do work, more sustainable way to do science, but so do these communities that are dealing with the waste stream. And so it can't be that single use plastics are the cost of doing business, the cost of innovation. Instead, we have to design a way, build infrastructure to better manage this resource. So that was the major kind of story behind how I ended up getting interested in this space. And since then, the amount of information I've learned about how gratuitous this waste stream is, how big it is, it's been shocking. And the other thing I would add to that, and I'll probably touch upon this later, is it's not, as a scientist, we know about the plastic in the waste bin. We know how that builds up, but what we don't think about is how much energy it takes to make this material and what that means for the environment. So I like to tell people that the problem is in the plastic and the plastics is a climate issue. And we'll get more into that later, I'm sure. 
Wow, I, I, that is an incredible story. And, and that's something I haven't really thought about is the energy that goes into making the plastics and where that ends up. And I, I think I'd be probably very disturbed to see all this like unfold if I actually saw where it, all our stockpiles of plastic ended up. And it's shocking when you say like, you didn't even get an experiment out of it for if something's been expired, for example, that just goes completely to waste. Um, and doesn't yeah. see the light of day, which is which is um, quite shocking. Um, and on that note, like when I do an experiment, there's it's funny because sometimes I feel this sense of like accomplishment when I see like a ton of like tips in my waste bin. Um, but yeah. at the same time, I feel that sense of guilt because I'm like, wow, I did a lot of experiments. Yes, that's awesome. Maybe I got a lot of data, but look at all that waste I'm generating. Uh, so it's just that kind of like that 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 kind of uh, mixed feeling that I get with all these tips that I'm using up. Um, it's a really good and, point. And me and James talk about it all the time. We used to measure our productivity by how high we could stack PCR plates. Back man, I have, yeah. a day. I, I have like a two foot stack of PCR plates. I now think about that much differently. That's like a wall of shame to me when I think about it because it's like, hey, could I have consolidated this and do a better like experiment so that I had more on one plate? It may have taken a little bit more planning, but I would have reduced the amount of waste by like twofold. So it's definitely changed the way that I think. Yeah, definitely. And um, with the difference between polycarbon tips and other co companies, can you speak on, on that? Um, what's the difference? Is there? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, the kind of glib answer is there is no difference between our tips and everyone else's. Uh, that's because we actually still use virgin material in the pipette tips that we actually manufacture. We do that at the request of all of our customers. Um, we started out putting our resin into pipette tips. Customers said, hey, you know what, if you don't put your material on the pipette tips, we'd prefer it if you put it in everything else, that'd be great. So what we have here, when I bring up one of these pipette tips you can't see because the background, is a, a packaging that is 100% circular economy resin, which means that by weight, these units are 65% to 92% circular economy resin by weight. That is not trivial. That is a significant impact that we're making here. So when I am talking to customers, I like to remind them, hey, you know, based on feedback that we got when we were launching these products initially, there was a lot of hesitation about putting recycled content in the tips themselves. There's a lot of low retention, low absorption properties of this plastic. People wanted more research before and, and more studies on it before we ultimately put in the tips. But we do put it in the pipette tip boxes and that ultimately creates the biggest benefit, which is supplanting virgin material on the market. And then another thing I'd like to shamelessly add is the difference between polycarbon and everybody else beyond the fact that we're the only circular economy product on the market is that we have total extended producer responsibility. We don't produce a single product that we can't recycle ourselves and that we want to recycle ourselves. So that's a major differentiator. That is such, um, I mean, those numbers are great, by the way, like when you put up those numbers and then you, um, I think you compare it to what we our productivity means and training people and the waste that comes around all of those training uh, modules and people going through boxes and boxes um, back order that makes a real impact when they hear those numbers. Um, I've got a bunch more of those numbers, so I'm looking yeah, forward. Well, to I think we're gonna we're gonna need much much more of those to convince a lot of people. But um, I think on those and then talking about that, um, no, I think one of the important things is. Um, so when you're trying to sell a product, right? I mean, you guys sort of have a business, but thinking about the, I mean, you had the business because you were leading with the data. The data was, you were there. You were also doing the the actual groundwork, right? So how much does real, how much real impact do you think sustainability has on science, on the real world? How much do you think that is? Um, I may ask you to elaborate on that because I would interpret that to mean what kind of difference can you make as an individual and what does that actually mean for a fight against climate change is that is that how i should read that question yeah because i think most people would think it's a small contribution like yes it's science it's not part of like the whole thing but do you think in the real world meaning like climate change um waste management like you said just making sure that we manufacture all of these how much do you think our impact on doing better sustainability would actually have a, a game on that. I was hoping that was the question you were asking. <laughs> um, that's great. So yes, an enormous impact. In fact, the problem, as I always say, is in the plastic. So to give you some frame of reference here, it takes a, over 100 megajoules of energy to produce a kilogram of polypropylene. That's five times the energy requirement to make a kilogram of steel. So this 
This material is actually remarkably energy intensive to produce. So not only is it the embodiment of hydrocarbons, of fossil fuels, it actually takes a tremendous amount of it to produce. And I want you to like think about that and then scale that, right? For this industry, biopharma and biotech, we're talking about 200 megatons of CO2 emissions associated with energy. Uh, associated with these industries, right? That's a tremendous footprint. It's actually 55% more emissions per dollar spent than the automotive industry. So without a doubt, we as scientists are part of a community that has an enormous impact on the environment, no doubt. Um, so the last statistic that's probably the most important to really consider is that when they evaluate scopes one, two, and three emissions coming from this industry, what they find is that up to 40% of the total emissions come from procured goods and services, the overwhelming which uh, number of which are single-use plastics. And so it's a huge problem, and I talk to our customers about it all the time, but I try to frame it as an opportunity because it really is an opportunity. We as an industry do not need to wait for hydrogen fuel cell technology develop, replacing fleets of trucks with EVs. We don't have to wait on cold fusion. We just have a huge plastic problem and their technology already exists to recycle this material. We just have to organize it. We just basically have to put it in a different bin. And so when I talk to scientists about this and they are frustrated or, or shocked by the statistics on how wasteful and how detrimental to the environment, to the efforts to fight against climate change that their plastic waste stream is, I remind them that it's the most effective, most cost-effective ROI you can imagine to just organize your plastic waste stream and be able to address 40% of the total emissions coming from your lab. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think those are, again, I love the numbers. I do enjoy that people will actually find real numbers in what you're saying, because I mean, it's so hard to convince people that some of these, uh, again, not minimal, but important changes affect huge on on, on our on our actual contribution. So um, next thing, and I think we should probably uh, at some point say like, we have no like contractual relationship. We didn't give money to Noah, he's not giving us money. We're actually doing this because I think it makes an impact on, on how scientific communication can do changes on this. And that's my next question. How, how do you think benefiting from um, your expertise, your background, and then going into how scientific communication can help find better sustainability in our research um, um, efforts? That's a really good question. And it leads to probably the, the thing that our company iterates on most, which is educating the consumer, educating the average scientist. Honestly, we're really lucky because our success as a company is predicated not necessarily on our patented software or our patented sorting methodologies, but rather the fact that there already exists this massive community of climate conscious scientists that care about this issue that have been looking for infrastructure and support to kind of empower them to make a bigger difference. And so providing them with the statistics, providing them with evidence-based solutions is critical and training them on how small efforts collectively can manifest as gigantic uh, impacts is, is probably the most important thing that we do in our meetings with our customers. And that's why we ultimately built the Carbon Counter Platform, which is a now third party uh, audited LCA backed platform for tracking carbon emissions, energy, conser uh, energy conservation, water conservation, and ultimately the most important step, uh, which is actually the conservation of crude oil equivalents. Um, I will shamelessly plug this one more stack because it's the one that I think is the most staggering. If you buy one case of pipette tips from Polycarbon, you are directly put leaving 26 pounds of crude oil equivalents underground. And that's not a carbon offset that we're buying from a different industry or like it's not theoretical trees not being cut down. It really means that directly in the market, you have now reduced the demand uh, for fossil fuels by 26 pounds of crude oil equivalents. And our customers love that stat. And when they are recycling with us, that, that tens of thousands of pounds. That should be your <laughs> Exactly, <laughs> right? Exactly. Uh, so anyway, when we're removing tens of thousands of pounds of recycled content for our customers, that really adds up very quickly. Okay. Yeah. And I think that's that's uh, that's incredibly important for, for my next question, because I think um, what we, like you said, education, right? So what we bring, we're bringing from our daily lives also impacts how we proceed in our careers and also in our research endeavors. So do you think that our, that our simple step that people take, let's say for example, yes, there's plastic, recycle, try to do your share, all of that. But in, in that sense, when you're looking at what people can actually do to change that mentality from, I, I probably, it doesn't matter. It's just a bottle. It's just a, a box of a pet, it's just trash. How do you think that 
minimum change in education or mindset can change again not just your professional life but also like how you do recycling or other activities related to your personal life um it, it's the reason we imbue all of our products with sustainability data um by making there be an associated cost and value to the commodities you consume on scale on a daily basis you can then measure that and you can you can then basically reward people for participating in a more sustainable program i think one of the most difficult issues faced by recycling industries in, in general besides the fact that nothing is designed to actually be recycled um is that no one really feels like they get credit or have any uh, actual proof that what they're doing is good when we at home throw something in a blue bin we just trust the state and the state-sponsored uh, material recovery facilities to manage that material and do something responsible with it. In reality, they do a bunch of studies and they find out, you know, less than like 15% of it's being actually recycled. Most of it's being exported. It's a disaster. So I do believe that providing supply chain transparency, tracking data, point of origin, all the way to uh, point of destination, information is critical for, especially this community that's such a data-backed uh, and evidence-based uh, community. Uh, so I, I do think that is is critical to kind of creating a trust in the system. That's awesome. Um, so in 2005, Harvard University did this shut the sash campaign where they were sort of asking researchers to close their fume hoods to help reduce this waste of energy. And they had an annual savings of $240,000 and reduced their greenhouse gas emissions by 300 metric tons. And that was just by 30% reduction of fume hood usage. That was it, like not even majority of fume hoods being shut off. What other cool initiatives have you heard about or have heard people doing to save energy in a lab setting? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think Migraine Labs is a leader in this space. Uh, they've been doing an international laboratory freezer challenge for a long time. It's the same concept, freezers minus 80s. These things are just like diesel generators. They just consume, consume energy. And they challenge people to reduce the temperature from 80% or from 80 degrees, minus 80 degrees Celsius to minus 70 degrees Celsius. That ultimately reduces the energy pull from the grid. You can create massive cost savings and massive uh, environmental benefits by doing this again on scale. Um, so that's a great challenge that I can think of off the top of my head. Um, I'm sure there's others out there. Forgive me for not knowing them right away. <laughs> I'm obviously focused primarily on the plastic, but that's a that's a great program and they, they run a really uh, effective campaign. And sorry to get Barzina, but no, um, do you have any anything that you could share about the, the migraine labs? I mean, the minus 80, the minus 70 data, if they have something where they can share and then we can post most people would actually like want to know like is there an actual effect on oh, doing like yeah. minus 80 to minus 70 so uh anything that you can share with us we'll be able to like share it on our on our platform so that i mean people that wouldn't want to i mean i just heard it and i'm, I'm, I'm about to do it I'm, gonna, I'm about to go change my settings so um if you if you have something to share with us like that would be great yeah absolutely I'll, I'll follow up after this uh this call awesome um so we know that you're partnered with the nih so i was wondering is there something that we can do when we're applying for grant funding through these bodies of funding, like whether it be NIH or NSF, that would help promote sustainability? Like, should we add a paragraph on the sustainability of our lab practices or our research practices? Man, I, I love that question. I actually, I believe that's a future we're heading for, where all of us are undergo are going to have to go through carbon auditing, where you're gonna have to demonstrate how you did what you did and what impact it had. Um, I know that there are efforts to do that now. I don't know if they're necessarily regulated or standardized. We're actually taking a lot of the data that we've had verified with this third party LCA and we're taking it to state governments and we're trying to get it qualified for landfill diversion credits, plastic recycling credits, um, emissions reduction credits so that our customers can ultimately benefit from cost savings just by participating in our program, by buying our products. Um, so we are making efforts to kind of make that connection. I do think we are probably a couple of years away from a more standard process in science of accounting for what were the resources you used to run the experiments you did. Because scientists fundamentally want to innovate. They're focused on the disease, the protein, the um, specific assays that they need to run. And I think we need to start changing their scope of understanding so that they understand that again this is an ecosystem with resources and they are critical pieces in the puzzle to make sure that we more efficiently use those resources and i think 
they already have the appetite for it. I, every scientist I talk to is annoyed by how much single use plastic they're throwing in a, a waste bin. So I do believe we're, we're on the verge of that. That's coming. Awesome. So what's on the horizon for polycarbon? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, as I said, our mission is ultimately to divert as much plastic as possible from landfills and incinerators, uh, which is the most uh, detrimental destination for the material to end up and replace as much virgin material in the market with our circular economy products. Part of that is expanding our portfolio. We can basically provide better services, more products to customers, and we can expand the amount of products that we can produce. So expanding the current polypropylene portfolio for our customers is a major priority. We're also gonna be launching the first ever line of circular economy GPPS project pro products. That's um, Petri dishes, serological pipettes, tissue culture plates, these sorts of things. Um, another one is gonna be uh, expanding geographically. We offer what are, we call on-site services, which are like a white glove end-to-end -end service where we provide the logistics in Northern California and Southern California. We're launching that in New England here in the next couple of months. We're really excited to bring on all these customers that we've been working on, working with remotely uh, and providing them these on-site services. Um, we're also really excitingly uh, working on co-branding and partnerships with existing incumbent brands that are selling non-competing products that we can ultimately put our resin into to expand the amount of access we have to the customer base, but also, again, continue to supplant virgin material in the market. Uh, we're looking at partnerships in the UK and the EU. That's probably gonna be more of a 12 month to 18 month project, but there's a huge demand for this in the um, EU and in UK. Uh, so we're really excited about that as well. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, partnering with state governments to try to qualify our data that has been verified with uh, landfill diversion, plastic recycling, and emissions uh, tax subsidies for our customers is a huge project. That's so awesome. I'm so happy and excited for you. <laughs> yeah, it's a really exciting time to be part of Polycarbon right now. Yeah, that is incredible. And I hope you also um, take over the Southern Hemisphere as well, because uh, I'll be heading to Sydney soon. Uh, for a new position so i'd love to um be able to access the polycarbon tips absolutely yeah um and one other thing for our listeners i know that a lot of them are very passionate about science sustainability so i'm wondering if there's any sort of partnership opportunities uh to maybe do beta testing for polycarbon um i'm wondering if there's any sort of offers that you you might have um available for the consumers out there that are curious but want to uh, basically explore that a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone who's curious obviously can get free samples from Polycarbon, test out our products. Our ask is that if you use our product and it's as effective as whatever you're currently using, why would you not switch? Because we have all the evidence. You can basically see our entire supply chain. We've quantified all of the impact. We know exactly what carbon emissions are coming from our system. It is incontrovertibly now the most sustainable product on the market. Why would you not switch? And we don't even ask you to switch your entire portfolio switch to 10% of your inventory to polycarbon products because it will make a significant difference. As, as I talked about, if you can buy one case of polycarbon pipette tips, you're going to be keeping 26 pounds of crude oil equivalents underground out of our atmosphere. Again, not carbon offsets, not kind of theoretical trees. We're talking about like actual demand in the market being replaced by a plastic that was old, made into a new product that is now replacing virgin material and fossil fuels. With that kind of statistic, I don't know why we're not jumping on board immediately. So I hope that I'm a lot of people- I'm placing orders over here, actually. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I think, um, honestly, this kind of brings up a, one last thing I want to say, which is one of the first questions I get from customers is, this sounds too good to be true. Like, is this real? And it's like a really good point because why hasn't been, why hasn't this been addressed historically? Why didn't somebody do this in the past? And it's honestly because the value of taking over the entire supply chain is the only way to do this. You can't segment this, do a part, you can't offer a take back program that makes someone else recycle. You can't produce products and then hope somebody else cleans up after it. You have to own the entire supply chain. That's what the true virtue of a circular supply chain is because we own all of it, because we're the stewards of the plastic throughout the entire supply chain, we can actually create the most value from it. And we can basically give that value back to our customers in, form, in, the, pro, in the form of cost competitive products. And I think, well, for me, I'll be uh, transitioning uh, and setting up my own lab um, back in Sydney. And that's a de decision I'm going to have to make because I'm not going to take my tips with me, the ones that I have now. Um, I'm going to have to um, basically order and make really big decisions on what companies I'm going to be purchasing from. 
And so this conversation is fantastic because now I have that kind of in the back of my mind. When I make those decisions, I'm thinking about science sustainability and thinking about the future and longevity of the lab as well. Um, First off, congrats on the lab. That's really exciting. Uh, that's gonna be a great time. If you don't end up taking the tips with you, Polycarbon also offers uh, expired tip recycling program. So if you're interested in giving us your recycled material, we ultimately put that. No, we have to. You have to leave with that. Like that. That's <laughs> another one. I mean, I, I hear like I, again. I just like I just started my lab as well. And one of the things is like you see all these plastic, and it's like where do we? They, they just want to throw it away. And I'm like, no, yeah. wait. There's got to be something else. You start hoarding them. But this should be out. So I think that's that's something important that people would probably benefit from knowing. So COVID created a disaster. We we call it the tip apocalypse when all the pipette tips went out of stock. Everyone massively overordered. And now we have we're coming up on periods of time where the products are expiring and people are reaching out to us desperate. Like I have like 10 pallets of tips that are gonna expire in the next six months. Like whatever we don't get through, can we send to you? And the answer is absolutely. Yeah, we'll take it, we'll put it into our products. It'll be a new generation of products. We'll re-sterilize it so that, that um, expiration date is prolonged for the future product and ultimately give it back to you at a discounted price. Oh, that's fantastic to know. Uh, so yeah, I'm wondering how much of it I should bring back. I'm, I'm getting shipping boxes but it's sort of like I'd rather take equipment than tips. So I have to make that call. Um, obviously yep. I can uh, share it with some other lab members nearby uh, that may be able to get that use, but knowing that they could be recycled is is just like music to my ears. And I'm glad to hear that for the environment's sake and for the, the life of that plastic, having seen, um, you know, that full cycle of life and not being, uh, you know, in landfill sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, that concludes our um, our uh, interview. I just want to say a huge thank you to Noah for joining us today. We learned so much, all those statistics, all that information about how we can make a difference is really inspiring. And I hope um, our listeners get something out of that and spread the word about the importance of science sustainability. Absolutely. And thank you all for the time. I really appreciate it. Hopefully I didn't you know, over answer questions, which I have a tendency to do. Um, but no, you were perfect. Yeah, I, oh, great. Um, fantastic. Uh, the last thing I'll leave you, leave you with is that hopefully the audience that's listening to this, just, just think about when you buy something, even if it's labeled sustainable, think about how it's made and think about how it's managed and try to figure out that that brand is going to do both. There's a lot of opportunities out there to make iterative improvements, but you need a holistic solution for the specific waste stream because otherwise you're just creating new plastics that you're putting out into the, putting out into the ecosystem and making it somebody else's job to manage. So um, let us know if you have any other follow-up questions. We're happy to answer anything through text or email. I will follow up with the information on the freezer challenge uh, so you all can have those statistics as well. Migraine Labs does an excellent job with evidence-based um, initiatives. So uh, we're happy to share that. Thank you so much, Noah. Thank you. It was great talking. So this is the end of our episode. Thank you guys for tuning in. Thanks for listening. This episode was great for us because it showed the sustainability efforts that people were trying to do um, in the importance of what we're trying to highlight and communicate, which is doing things well, doing things in the right way, but also communicating what we're doing and what we're sharing with other people as well. So we hope you enjoyed this episode. We also have the interview about mentoring. We also had this episode with the little um, um, assessment that Vic did for the Aragda meeting. And the next episodes will actually be recapping on the immunologically relevant um, aspects of post-COVID era, as well as we'll have um, book months in September. And then hopefully in October, we're gonna have a live episode um, from the ASIP in Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, so stay tuned. Um, if you wanna follow the people from Polycarbon, we have their social media posted here. They do have a beta testing um, asset to it so where you can test their pipettes and everything to reach out to them and also try to do as much as you can on their sustainability efforts that we're trying to share with you guys. It's something that's always good for the environment, for, for, for people to feel good about sharing some of these efforts, but also because we want to be able to keep doing what we do. So thank you and keep tuned for the next episode.